We're now ready to start our study of chapter four, applications of the derivative. We've covered the derivative and we've practiced taking the derivative of different types of functions. We've learned about implicit differentiation and logarithmic differentiation. We're now ready to look at how the derivative is used to model things in the real world. We're going to learn how to use the derivative to describe the behavior of a graph, whether the function is increasing or decreasing, whether it has a maximum or a minimum, and exactly where it is, whether the curve is actually concave down or concave up, and where those inflection points are, where it changes curvature from concave up to concave down or vice versa. We're also going to be able to look at defining the differential. What exactly is this dx and this dy? We'll talk about some other applications of the derivative as well. We're gonna start our study of these applications with what's called related rates. Related rates are when you have a real world situation and you're modeling how one variable changes and how another variable changes. Often these are with respect to time. Let's consider an example. One of the examples might be where we have a balloon, we've blown up the balloon, but we're going to either heat it up or force more air in, in which case both the volume and the pressure of the air inside the balloon are changing. As that happens, both the volume changes with respect to time and the pressure changes with respect to time. That means we have two derivatives, dv dt and dp dt. We want to study how these relate to each other and come up with equations that relate volume to pressure so that we can predict, say, the change in the volume with respect to time if we know something about the change in pressure with respect to time. We're also going to be able to do the following learning objectives. We're going to start by expressing the quantities in terms of derivatives. This is an application of derivatives, so derivatives will be the major focus. We're gonna find the relationships between the derivatives by writing an equation that relates the variables. And we'll use chain rule to find the rate of change of one quantity that depends on the rate of change of other quantities. Unfortunately, there's no one method that works for all related rates problems. There are some techniques that get used often, and I've chosen a wide variety of examples so that we can see many different ways of solving these related rates problems. I'm going to share my screen with you and we'll get started. Because we're studying application problems by their very nature, every problem in this section is a word problem. They're modeling real world situations. We're gonna to learn together how to approach these word problems and use the parts of speech, yes, that's right, English grammar, to help us structure and set up these problems. I've gone ahead and I've written down the steps to solving a related rates problem. It's probably not gonna make a huge amount of sense to you when we first read through them because they really only make sense while you're working the problem. But I wanted them written down in one place so that when you're working a related rates problem, you can refer to the steps to be sure you haven't omitted something. If you get stuck on a problem, come back to the steps and see if you've omitted a step. That omitted step probably provides crucial information you need to complete the problem. Let's go ahead now and let's take a look at these steps for solving related rates problems. There are many of them. Our goal is to find the rate of change or derivative of one of the variables in a situation at a particular moment in time. It's usually time, not always, but usually. This is going to be our problem setup strategy. You're gonna read the problem once through for a general idea of the situation. 
you're not going to pause. You're not going to write anything down. You're just going to read through it and get a vague idea. Are we talking about cubes or circles or triangles, cone shapes? Are we talking about money? Are we talking about something else? Just a vague idea of what kind of problem it is. Then we're going to go through it a second time, much more slowly. In step two, we break the words into the parts of speech. The verb phrase, the subject phrase, conjunctions like and, but, or, and nor, prepositional phrases, subordinate clauses. We use the semicolon and the comma to know where to pause. And basically, we're going to pause every two to three words. And we're going to make note of the information in the problem by drawing a picture, labeling everything we can, and writing down any information contained in the problem. By the time you finish step two, there should be no need to go back to the word problem. Everything you need should be written down in a picture and in representations in mathematics. Part three is to label every part of the picture, assigning symbols to all the variables involved. We may label something X, something else Y, perhaps we use Z or theta. You're going to want to define on the picture what those represent. It really helps to have the picture. I can't imagine doing a related rates problem without a picture. The picture is the key to the setup. After step three, we're going to figure out what form the answer should take, and we're going to write something like x equals and draw a blank. That way, when we know what that value is, we know we've reached the end of the problem. These are long, complicated problems. Related rates is a very challenging section, probably one of the top three most challenging in the course, along with the epsilon delta definition of the proof of a limit. They're going to take time and you may forget by the time you get to the bottom what it was you were looking for. You're going to write it down explicitly with a blank space so you know what it is you're looking for at all times. When that blank is filled in, then you know you're finished. Step five is when we actually start the related rate setup problem. We're going to find an equation that relates the variables we found when we labeled every part of the picture. In other words, we need an equation that, for example, will relate volume to pressure. This is a known equation from physics. These equations aren't ones you're supposed to find yourself. They'll be known equations that will either be given or they'll be obvious, such as the area of a circle is pi r squared. Let's now take a look at the next step. I said there are a lot, there are nine. In step six, we're going to take the equation that relates the variables in the problem, for example, volume and pressure, and applying the chain rule, we're going to differentiate both sides of the relating equation with respect to the independent variable, often time represented as t. This equation will relate the derivatives. So we'll have a dv dt and a dp dt. In step seven, we substitute all the known and given values into the equation. Again, we're trying to find something about a rate of change of a variable at a specific point in time. We wait until after we've taken the derivative of both sides of the relating equation before we substitute the given values of that point in time. Then we substitute the values into the derivative equation we got from step six. Do not substitute the values in until after you have taken the derivative of the relating equation. It will not work if you do it beforehand. In step eight, we're gonna check that the units of measure are consistent with what the answer should be. For example, if I'm looking for the change in volume with respect to time, 
volume should be measured in something like centimeters cubed or inches cubed, and time should be in seconds or hours. So a reasonable answer is cubic inches divided by seconds. If I got square inches divided by seconds squared, I know I've done something wrong. If the units don't work, it's almost certainly set up incorrectly. If the units are correct, it's probably set up correctly, but you still could have a careless mistake. Let's make sure in step number nine that the answer is reasonable. For example, if the volume is getting smaller, decreasing with respect to time, volume is going down, time always is positive since we move forward in time. That means the rate of change, dv dt, should be negative. Did you get a negative? If not, examine the problem in the setup to see why that might be so. All right, we've gone over the rules. And again, they'll make more sense to you as you work through the setup of the problems. Go ahead and print them out and have them next to you as you're working through the problems in the homework set. If you skip a step, it's going to cause a problem in your setup and may get you stuck. Make sure you go through the steps until they become second nature for you. Including the units is probably the best way of knowing whether or not it's set up correctly. It's really our only indicator that something may have gone awry. It's also beneficial sometimes to draw two pictures, a sort of before picture and an after picture. In the case of the balloon, you might draw the balloon at t equals zero. And if the volume is decreasing, then later in time, the balloon would be smaller. It helps to have the picture of the larger original balloon and a picture of it smaller later on. This makes it more clear that the volume is decreasing, which may in fact cause the pressure to increase. Again, I want to emphasize that you must not substitute any of the values at the specific point you want to find the rate of change until after you have taken the derivative of the relating equation. It will not work if you substitute beforehand. Substituting in the values occurs after you've taken the derivative of both sides of the equation with respect to the independent variable. The problem is if you substitute ahead of time, one of the values may become a constant and the derivative of a constant, of course, is zero. But it could have been changing with respect to time, so the derivative really isn't zero. Make sure you substitute after you take the derivative. Let's now take a look at our first example which is a more straightforward example, not as difficult as the ones that come after. They're not all arranged in order of decreasing or increasing difficulty. Um, they're sort of mixed up, but to a certain extent, they do get a little bit harder as we go along. Harder doesn't always mean longer. Sometimes harder means it's just confusing how to even get started and how to come up with that relating equation. We'll see a couple of these later on when we work a fishing reel problem and the rate of change for the hour hand and minute hand of a tower clock. Let's now practice the steps that we learned together. Step one, read through the problem once to get a vague idea of what we're dealing with. The volume of a cube decreases at a rate of 0.5 cubic feet per minute. What is the rate of change of the side length when the side lengths are 12 feet? All I got out of it was I have a cube and it's getting smaller. That's all I got. Good enough. I don't need any more. Starting at the beginning again, I'm going to break it apart in step two by the parts of speech, the subject phrase, the verb phrase, prepositional phrases, conjunctions, 
punctuation marks. For those of you who didn't excel in English grammar, go every two to three words and stop. You'll kind of know where you need to stop. The volume, subject of a cube, stop right there. That's a prepositional phrase in case you didn't know, but I have a cube. I'm going to stop and I'm going to draw the picture of a cube. And maybe I need to lower this down a little bit. Make sure that you've drawn a picture of the cube before you go on. Now it's a cube, right? Which means that the lengths of all the sides are the same. To force people to recognize that it's a cube, I'm gonna go ahead and label each side as X. Now I know for sure by looking at my picture that this is a cube. Go back to the, the statement of the problem and pick up where you left off. The volume of a cube decreases. The volume is changing and getting smaller. Okay, the volume is changing and getting smaller, then the cube is getting smaller. Those won't be X lengths because the original is X lengths. I don't know what these will be. I could label them something else. Um, perhaps, I don't know, let's use Z. I can't imagine I'll need Z for anything else. So I'll try Z. All right, the volume is decreasing at a rate of 0.5 cubic feet per minute. Notice that the units here are 0.5 cubic feet per minute. That matches a rate of change of volume with respect to time, but it's decreasing. dV dt is what they're giving you with this rate, but because it's decreasing, it must be negative. So I'm gonna come to the side and write dV dt equals negative 0 0.5 cubic feet per minute. The negative comes from the word decreases. All right, let's continue. I'm completely done with sentence one and I'll never go back to it. Everything I need to know from that sentence is in my picture and what I've written down mathematically. Next sentence, what? Nothing to write. Is, verb phrase, nothing to write. The rate of change. Derivative. If it says rate of change, I'm looking for a derivative. Of the side length. Oh, well, my original side is x, and this is after it got shrunk, so I think I should use the first one. dx dt. The rate of change is with respect to time. What is the rate of change of the side length? Okay, when, right? They're gonna tell me at what point I need to evaluate. When the side lengths, which are the X values, are 12 feet. I need to evaluate dx dt when X equals 12 feet and get an answer. This is where you draw the blank. When I have this information, I know I'm done and I can stop. Now, what do you expect is happening to the rate of change of the side length? Look at your picture here. Is X getting larger or smaller? Time is always gonna move forward. So DT is always positive. The sign of the rate of change is going to come from the rate of change of the variable on top. In our case, side length. The sides are getting smaller, so I expect a negative. I don't know, but I expect a negative value. Okay, um, I've reached the end of the problem and I don't have anything else to write down. Go back to the steps for what you're supposed to do. Label every part of the picture, assigning symbols to all of the variables involved. I already have them. Step four, figure out what form the answer should take and draw a blank. It's there. Step five, 
find an equation that relates the variables in the problem. I need to relate V and X. I'm given the rate of change of volume, so I know it's probably going to be used. I'm looking for DX DT, so I need to relate volume and X. Well, I know what the volume of a cube is. It's the side length cubed. So my relating equation is going to be, and I'm going to abbreviate equation with EQN, V equals X cubed. This is step five. Do not substitute the 12 feet. If you do, when you take the derivative, you're going to get zero and that's not correct. Make sure you wait until after you've taken the derivative of both sides of the relating equation with respect to the independent variable, which in our case is time. Step six, apply the chain rule and take the derivative of the relating equation. This is going to give me the derivative with respect to time of V equal the derivative with respect to time of X cubed. V is not T. That means I get dV dt on the left side of this equation. On the right side, X is not the independent variable. It's a dependent variable and it depends on the time. As time goes on, X becomes smaller. It's changing with respect to time. I have to invoke the chain rule because these variables do not match. The derivative of the outside is 3X squared. And then I multiply by the derivative of the inside function, DX DT. This is step six. Take the derivative of the relating equation to get a relationship between their rates of change. Now, in step seven, now we are allowed to substitute values. I know what dVdt is, it was given, and I know what I want to evaluate the x value as, it's given us 12 feet. Now we're going to substitute those in, and what I want to solve for is dx dt. You have a choice here. You can either solve for dx dt first and then substitute, or substitute and then solve for dx dt. It should make no difference in the answer. It's just a personal preference. I'm going to substitute values now. And I replace the derivative of volume with respect to time with negative 0 0.0 or negative 0.5, and I keep the units cubic feet per minute equals, I substitute 12 feet for the variable x, and I square it. I'm trying to find dx dt. When I square 12 feet, I get 144 square feet, and I need my calculator. What is 144 times three? That gives me 432. To solve for dx dt, I need to multiply both sides by the reciprocal or divide both sides by 432 square feet. On the left, I'm gonna write it out longhand so that you can see how the units cancel. Now, I was expecting a negative value for dx dt. What units do you expect? Well, x is a side length. So since we're using feet, I'm expecting feet. And the time has been given in minutes, so I'm expecting feet per minute. If I don't get units that are feet per minute, I probably set it up wrong and I need to go back and check. If I take cubic feet, divided by square feet, I get feet. And when I take this value, I should get my answer, which comes out to be, make sure it matches what I had before, and it does, 
negative one foot over 864 minutes. In other words, the volume is changing faster with a smaller rate of change in the side length. Make sure that you check your units at the end to be sure they match your expectation. We expected X to be measured in feet and time is measured in minutes. We also expected that X was decreasing over time and we did get a negative value here. Let's now take a look at the next example, example two. In example two, we have a rectangle initially has dimensions two centimeters by four centimeters. All sides begin increasing in length at a rate of one centimeter per second. At what rate is the area of the rectangle increasing after 20 seconds? About all I got out of it was it's a rectangle and I think it's getting bigger. This is step one of our process. In step two, we go back and we break it apart using the parts of speech. Subject phrase, verb phrase, prepositional phrases, punctuation, about every two to three words. A rectangle. I should draw one. When I draw a rectangle, I want to leave space to label the sides. Initially, when time is zero, it has dimensions two centimeters by four centimeters. So originally, my width is two centimeters and my length is four centimeters. Next sentence, all sides, meaning all four sides of the rectangle, begin increasing in length at a rate of one centimeter per second. Because it says increasing, I know the rate of change must be positive. This is telling me that the rate of change of the width with respect to time equals a positive one centimeter per second. And this is the same as the rate of change of the length. Now I want to draw a picture of what it might look like at a later point in time, a sort of before and after. Later, I know that the width is more and the length is more. I know that they are functions of time. Now I look at the last sentence. At what rate is the area Hmm. Rate means derivative. So I want the derivative of the area with respect to time of the rectangle. Okay, that would represent dA dt. Increasing, well, it would be getting bigger if the sides are getting longer. After 20 seconds, I want to know what it is precisely when t equals 20 seconds. I've broken it apart into the parts of speech. The next thing I need to do is label everything I can. I know this is not the same w because it's gotten wider. How can I tell how much wider? Well, the rate of change is one centimeter per second. So in five seconds, it's gotten five centimeters bigger. The time period is the number of centimeters that it increases. So I can represent this one over here as W plus T and L plus T, where T is measured now in centimeters. For example, after five seconds, the width will be seven and the length will be nine centimeters. I need to now come up with the blank space, the next step in our process, which I actually added as part of step two. I've labeled everything I can in the picture as part of step three, and I have the variables I think I'll need. My expectation is that the area is increasing, so I expect this to come out to be positive. 
My next step is step number five. Find a relating equation between what you're given and what you're trying to find. I'm looking for area and I have length and width. So I know what the formula is going to be. This is going to be area equal to length times width. Again, we write our relating equation from the original picture, the before. Now that I have a relationship, remember that L depends on time and so does W. The next step in the process, step number six, is to take the derivative of the relating equation. This will give you dA dt equal, now we'll have to use the product rule. So I get dL dt times w, which I'll put at the front, plus dW dt times L, which I'll again write at the front so they don't mistakenly get into the derivative. Remember that w is a function of time and L is a function of time. There'll be different values at 20 seconds. I've now taken the derivative, so it's time to substitute values in. When I substitute values in, in this problem, I'm looking for dA dt, and my derivative equation is solved for dA dt but I'll need to know what W is at 20 seconds and L at 20 seconds. I'll need DL dt and DW dt. I know the two rates of change are a positive one centimeter per second. What about W and L? Note that W is given by W plus T. If T is zero, it's two centimeters. At 20 seconds, I would be adding two centimeters to, or 20 centimeters to the two centimeters. It will come out to be 22 centimeters, which means I can substitute 22 centimeters in place of W. Then I replace the rate of change of length with one centimeter per second. L is also changing and at 20 seconds, I should have added 20 centimeters to my original four, giving me 24 centimeters times its rate of change, which is the same. When I multiply these out, I'm going to get 22 square centimeters per second plus 24 square centimeters per second, giving me a value of 46 square centimeters per second. Again, you want to evaluate the limits. This is going to be step eight. Do the limit units, or rather do the units match what I was expecting. The rate of change of area with respect to time should be square units with respect to time. And I have centimeters per second squared. Is it a reasonable answer? Based on my picture, the area is getting larger, so it should be positive. This meets my expectation, and that's step nine. We're now ready to take a look at example three. Example three I've found over the years is quite difficult for students to set up, not because they can't do the mathematics, but because they don't understand how a piston works in an engine. A piston, I've drawn some pictures to help you understand it so that we can set up the problem correctly. Think of the piston as one of those ice cream push pops that you have. For some reason, I always imagine them with orange sherbet. It contains a tube like a toilet paper tube with ice cream on the inside. At the bottom, there's a little round cardboard piece attached to a stick. As you eat the ice cream, you push the stick, causing this cardboard to rise and pushing the ice cream up so you can get to it. 
That's basically what a piston is. In an engine, we have a piston looking something like the picture on the left. The shape of the cylinder does not change. It cannot change inside of an engine. Typically, they're cylindrically shaped. In other words, kind of like a Coke can. The bottom is a circle and it has a round metal part at the top attached to a rod that will push it down instead of the ice cream, which pushes up. What happens in a gasoline engine is that the injector, which you've probably heard of, will push in a mixture of gasoline and air into this empty space you see here, this cylindrical tube. Then this piston arm is going to push down. It will decrease the volume and increase the pressure. As the volume decreases, note that the height of the piston is also getting lower, closer to the bottom of the piston system. The bottom is what we'll call height equals zero. What happens when it reaches wherever it needs to reach for pressurizing that gasoline and air mixture? It reaches a certain point and the spark plug fires and creates a spark. The spark ignites the gasoline air mixture. That's right, you're driving around on thousands of small explosions at any point in time. As it explodes, because you've ignited this gasoline air mixture, it pushes the piston up very quickly. That energy from pushing up the piston is translated into rotating the wheels. So the power from pushing it up from that explosion is what causes the car to move. Now, when we're looking at this, there are some things that you have to know about the way a piston is set up. First off, the area of the chamber, the region of the chamber does not change. The radius does not get bigger or smaller. When you're looking at your ice cream, the radius is a constant, and it will be in a piston inside of an engine as well. However, as the piston moves down, it does compress the air, so the volume is changing. The radius is not, but the volume is. How can that be? The volume of a cylinder is the area of the base, which is a circle, pi r squared, times its height, h. If the radius isn't changing, but the volume is, then it must be the height is decreasing. And that, in fact, is what happens until you compress the gas and air mixture enough to cause another mini explosion with the spark plug. All right. Now that you understand what a piston is, we're ready to set up the problem. Step one, read the problem to get a vague idea of what we're talking about. A piston is seated at the top of a cylindrical chamber with radius five centimeters when it starts moving into the chamber at a constant speed of three centimeters per second. What is the rate of change of the volume of the cylinder when the piston is two centimeters from the base of the chamber. Okay, really all I got out of that was piston and cylinder, that's it. I didn't get anything else. There were too many words, I couldn't keep track. Now we're gonna go back and step two, break it apart into roughly every two to three words. A piston, I have a picture of a piston here, is seated. Okay, at the top, okay, of a cylindrical chamber. Okay, so I have my chamber. Well, let's see, I'll draw it over here. It does have to have kind of thick walls because of all the explosions. And it's seated at the top, right there. All right, it's at the top. With radius five centimeters. Okay, I know how a piston works, so the radius won't change. So this distance from here to here is five centimeters. All right, 
when it starts moving, okay, into the chamber. So it must be coming down, all right? So I'm going to draw it again and note that for a piston, the outside shape is not going to change. It's the same size. I'm trying to make them the same size. I probably should have copied and pasted. But this is moving down. Okay, so it's lower. Okay, moving into the chamber. I got it. All right. At a constant speed. Hang on a minute. Speed is always non-negative. Speed is the absolute value of velocity. It has no direction. So the magnitude is three centimeters per second. Could this be referring to the volume? No. Volume would have units of cubic centimeters. This can't be referring to the change in the volume. Well, what else is changing? The radius is the same, but the height is changing. Originally, my height goes from here to the bottom of the chamber. Later, my height goes from here to that. The height is decreasing with time. That means that dh dt has to actually be a negative three centimeters per second. Those units do match what I expect for height. Now I'm ready for the next sentence. What, got it, is the rate of change, derivative, of the volume, wait a minute, EV dt of the cylinder, okay, when the piston, Okay, they're going to tell me the exact point to evaluate. Is two centimeters from the base of the chamber. Okay. How am I going to measure the height? Well, if I measure the height from the bottom up instead of the top down, if I make this height h equals zero, then they want to know what it is when the height is two centimeters. So find dv dt when h equals two centimeters. This is what I'm looking for. dv dt should have units of cubic centimeters per second. Do I expect the volume to increase or decrease? It starts at the top then moves down. So the volume is getting smaller. So I'm expecting a negative. All of that is our step two. Step three, label every part of the picture. I actually did that as part of step two. I'm trying to think if there's anything else I can add, but I think I've pretty well labeled everything. Step four, figure out what form the answer should take. I did that as part of translating in step two. VDT when height is two centimeters. Step five, find the relating equation. I have an H and I have a V and R is a constant. So I want a relating equation to relate R, H, and V. Let's go ahead and write down that equation now. Our relating equation is the volume of a cylinder, which is area of the base. So for example, take your Coke can. It's the area of the circular bottom times the height of the can. The area of the circle at the bottom is going to be pi times r squared, and the height is h. This is the formula for any regular solid where the cross sections are all the same size and the same shape. Area of the base times the height. Now I know that R is not changing. It's always five centimeters. So I can rewrite this equation by substituting the five centimeters and squaring it. This gives me 25 pi centimeters squared times h equal to the volume. 
That's step five. Notice that I was able to substitute for the radius only because I knew it never changed. The height does change, so I cannot substitute the two centimeters until I reach the end of the problem. Now that I have the relating equation, we take the derivative of both sides with respect to the independent variable t. This gives me dv dt equal, well, the 25 pi centimeters squared is all a constant. So it's multiplied by dh dt. If the radius were also changing, I would not have been able to substitute. And I would have had to use the product rule and the chain rule. Now I have an equation that relates the rate of change of volume to the rate of change of the height. I've forgotten what I'm looking for, so I'm going to go check my blank, which tells me I'm trying to find dv dt. So I'll leave the equation solved for that. Now that I have the derivative, I can substitute h equals 2 centimeters. In this case, though, notice there's no h. In fact, what this tells you is that the rate of change of the volume is not dependent on the height. It's changing at the same rate all the way down. So when I find dv dt at two centimeters, it's actually dv dt at all centimeters. dh dt is a negative three centimeters per second. That was given in the original problem. This means that my result is a negative 75 pi cubic centimeters per second. Does that match with the units? Again, we've substituted, although there was no place to substitute H. And we're now checking the reasonableness of the units. Centimeters cubed is volume, seconds is time, that matches. Is it a reasonable answer? The volume was decreasing, so I'm expecting a negative, and I got one. Let's now take a look at example four. We're going to set this one up and go through the steps. Then I'm going to pause the video to let you work it out on your own, and then we'll come back and we'll compare our results. This one is rather difficult, I'll be honest. It's difficult to understand exactly what's happening and the picture is truly the key. Go through our steps, read it once. A jet ascends at a 10 degree angle from the horizontal with an airspeed of 550 miles per hour, its speed along its line of flight. How fast is the altitude of the jet increasing? If the sun is directly overhead, how fast is the shadow of the jet moving on the ground? Well, I got a plane flying in the air and there were two questions, which makes me think maybe they're looking for two things. Let's go back in step two and break it apart. A jet. Okay, I don't know how to draw my plane yet because I don't know what it's doing. Ascends, goes up at a 10 degree angle on the horizontal. Okay, well, then here's my, um, here's my horizontal, and here's my plane. I can't draw very well, so that's my plane. And he's going up, and I've really got that way too big, but I'm going to draw it that way anyway. He's going up at a 10-degree angle. Okay, all right, I got that much. With an airspeed of 550 miles per hour. Well, that's a rate, and it's like velocity, and he's going up, so later on he's over here. Um, the rate of change of something is 550 miles per hour. Later in time, my plane's going to be over here, which means he's changing position along this slanted line here. Well, then I need a variable for that. Well, um, I don't know what else to call Let's call it Z. Okay. 
then the airspeed is dz dt. This is my 550 miles per hour. And because he's going up, I'm going to say it's positive. He is moving forward. Z is increasing with respect to time. How fast? Okay, fast. Fast means velocity. Is the altitude of the jet increasing? Altitude, altitude, altitude. Oh, okay. Well, they're talking about this distance. Altitude. Well, I probably would call that H for height. I know that this is going to be a right angle. So how fast is the altitude changing? Well, it is getting bigger. Height is increasing. So this must be dH dt. In this particular question, there was no point in time, which must mean it doesn't matter. Okay, well, that's kind of weird. Not what we've seen so far, but that's all there is in the words. Next sentence. If the sun okay, is directly overhead, okay, well, hmm, I'm going to draw my sun up here somewhere. Okay. There's my sun. How fast? Is the shadow of the jet, shadow of the jet, where would the shadow of the jet be? Well, it would be on the ground. So I'm going to put the ground down here, a little tree, maybe a house. All right. The shadow of the jet is going to be on the ground down here. It starts here over the tree and then it moves to the right. Hmm. So the shadow's moving on the horizontal, though the plane is not. How fast is the shadow of the jet moving on the ground? How fast? Fast is velocity again, so I need a rate of change of something. Well, what's changing in this picture? Hmm. Well, this distance. This is the initial point. And this is the later point which is also this change in the horizontal on the blue triangle up above. That means I could label that maybe X, we could call it something else, but this distance down here is X. I must be looking for the change in X with respect to time. And again, I'm going to expect that it's positive. There's no particular point that they gave me that they wanted me to evaluate this. So there won't be anything to plug in. But this setup was really quite complicated. Let's now take a look at finding a relating equation. For the first one, I need to relate H to maybe Z, X, and 10 degrees. If I'm looking for DH, DT, I know something about dz dt, so I expect I need to use z, but I might not need x. Can I relate z, h, and 10 degrees? Yes, I can use the definition of sine as opposite over hypotenuse because this is a right angle. This means the sine of 10 degrees, change color back to match this part, sine of 10 degrees is equal to the height divided by z. Now me personally, I know I'm looking for the hdt. I'm going to solve this for the height. This is my first relating equation for the first question. I'm going to rewrite this as h equals z times sine of 10 degrees. All my Z's have horizontal bars, otherwise they're twos. I'm afraid they look almost identical. I have a relating equation. I know the sine of 10 degrees is actually a constant. 
Make sure your calculator is in degree mode. And let's take the derivative of both sides. This gives us the h dt equal dz dt times the sine of 10 degrees. I said I was gonna pause and I forgot to do so. I'm going to let you finish this part, but before we stop and pause for you to work on your own, let's take a look at the second question. Find dx dt. There are several ways to go here. I can relate x to h, or I can relate x to z. Because the z was given, it's better to use the exact value, which will come from dz dt, which means I need to use adjacent and hypotenuse or cosine. Write your relating equation for that question, take the derivative and solve. Then turn the video back on and we'll compare our answers. Did you get 550 miles per hour times sine of 10 degrees at 4 dh dt, which is approximately 95.5 miles per hour? In the second part, I needed to find a relating equation for x and z. I could have used h, but notice that h is more complicated. I would not use the approximation 95.5 since that would propagate error and cause it to be more out of um, exact exactitude. Never use an approximate value at an intermediate step. Always use the exact. You could, but I wouldn't recommend it. I recommend using x in the original for which you know the exact rate of change, z. Rewriting the relating equation and taking the derivative of both sides, I get dx dt equals dz dt times cosine of 10 degrees, which gives me approximately 541.6 miles per hour. Let's take a look now at example five. Example five is a classic related rates problem. There are multiple ways to set up these ladder against the wall problems where the setups are slightly different. However, most of them do use the Pythagorean theorem. Let's take a look now and read through it to get a vague idea of our situation. A 12-foot ladder is leaning against a vertical wall when David begins pulling the foot of the ladder away from the wall at a rate of 0.2 feet per second. What is the configuration of the ladder at the instant that the vertical speed of the top of the ladder equals the horizontal speed of the foot of the ladder? That is, what is the height of the ladder against the wall at that point in time and the distance of the foot of the ladder from the wall at the same instant. That's a lot of words. I have a ladder leaning against a wall and it starts falling. That's what I got. Let's go back and break it apart into the parts of speech. A 12 foot ladder, okay, got it, is leaning, okay, got it, against a vertical wall. Well, then I need a vertical wall. So I'm going to have a tree and I've got a building. And here is my 12 foot ladder. And it's a vertical wall, so that's a right angle. Anything else I can add from the first phrases? Nope. When David begins pulling the foot of the ladder, away from the wall. Hmm. Well, the tree and the building aren't going to change from picture one to picture two. They're the same. But the ladder, if he's pulling at the bottom of the ladder down here, then it must mean that the ladder goes further out like this. And he's still over here pulling on the ladder. Okay, this is still a right angle and the ladder didn't magically grow. It's still 12 feet long. 
So what changed? Well, I'll figure that out in a second. At a rate of 0.2 feet per second, what is he pulling at that rate? Well, he's pulling the bottom of the ladder and the bottom of the ladder is measuring this part right here. Well, it's horizontal, let's call it X. Then the rate is 0.2 feet per second. Should it be positive or negative? Well, X is getting longer, so it's increasing. So DX DT should be positive, okay? Next question. What is the configuration of the ladder at the instant that the vertical speed of the, whoa, what's the configuration? What did that second sentence tell us? What's the height of the ladder against the wall? Oh, what's the height? That's the configuration. All right, height of the ladder, height of the ladder. Well, this is the height right here and right here. And it's definitely changing, it's getting smaller. So I want to find the actual height of the ladder, not the rate of change. I'm looking for, I'm looking for the height of the ladder. H equals something, when? At the instant, that the vertical speed, that speed means absolute value of velocity, of the top of the ladder, top of the ladder, how is the top of the ladder moving? Well, that's changing H. So the speed of the top of the ladder is the absolute value of dH dt. equals, okay, equals something, I can put the equals in, the horizontal speed, speed is absolute value, of the foot of the ladder. Well, the foot of the ladder is changing x, so that would be the absolute value of dx dt. Okay. That is, what is the height of the ladder against the wall at that point in time, got it, and the distance of the foot of the ladder from the wall, oh, well, that's x, at the same instant, oh, well, then I also need to find x at that point in time. Okay, well, I know that the foot of the ladder is moving at a rate of 0.2 feet per second. Okay, what else can I say? Well, if it's always 0.2 feet per second, then what is dH dt? Well, that would be when dH dt is a negative 0.2 feet per second. That's the instant where their derivatives are equal. How do I get their derivatives to be equal? Well, I have to relate h and t. This is where the Pythagorean theorem comes in. Our relating equation will relate x, h, and the length of the ladder, 12 feet. Go ahead and write down your Pythagorean equation, then take the derivative of the relating equation and solve for h and x when the two derivatives are equal to each other in magnitude, but not in sign. Pause the video now to work it out and turn it back on to check your answer. Our relating equation is x squared plus h squared equals 12 feet squared, which is 144 square feet. We take the derivative of the relating equation, invoking chain rule since x and h do not match the independent variable time. 2x dx dt plus 
plus 2H dH dt equals zero since 144 is a constant. We don't take the derivative of the units. I have a two that's a common factor, which I can divide out to leave me with a simplified equation. Now I know dx dt can be replaced with 0.2 feet per second. And I know that this is the instant when their magnitudes are the same, but dh dt is decreasing. So I replace it with negative 0.2 feet per second. Then because that term was negative, I went ahead and moved it to the other side of the equation. That made the 0.2 feet per second a common factor on both sides, so I divided it out, which told me that that instant is when x equals h, the height of the ladder on the wall and the distance of the bottom of the ladder from the wall are the same. But I know from the Pythagorean theorem that I can use this relating equation again. But if x equals h, I can write 2x squared equal 144 square feet. Dividing by 2 and then taking the square root gives me 6 square roots of 2 feet for both the height and x, the distance from the wall. Notice I ignored the negative solution because the distance must be strictly positive. Let's take a look at one more example. Example six, let's read through it and apply the process. Sand falls from an overhead bin and accumulates in a conical pile, a cone, like a funnel, with a radius that is always three times its height. Suppose the height of the pile increases at a rate of two centimeters per second when the pile is 12 centimeters high. At what rate is the sand leaving the bin at that instant? Well, I got sand falling into like a, well, a cone shape, right? Like a pyramid, but with a circular bottom. So let's go back and break it apart and try to write down a picture that describes the situation. Sand, got it, falls, coming down from an overhead bin. Okay, well, I've got a bin and there's a bunch of sand in it. And the sand is coming out of the bin and accumulates in a conical pile. Okay, and I'm gonna draw a cone the circular base like that with a radius got it that is always okay three times its height well i didn't draw that did i r which is from the center to the edge is equal to three h and this distance is h. All right, okay, next sentence. Suppose the height of the pile increases at a rate, oh, dh dt then, it's increasing, so it should be positive, of two centimeters per second. Let's write that down before we forget it. DH dt equals two centimeters per second. When the pile is 12 centimeters high. Oh, well, that's only the rate at 12 centimeters when H equals 12 centimeters, okay. At what rate is the sand, I'm looking for a derivative, leaving the bin? at that instant. So I do want to use that dh dt, but, but I, I don't know what the rate of sand leaving would be. So the amount of sand in the bin is changing. So I, I want the rate of change of the amount of sand. 
well, how are you going to measure the amount of sand? Measure it with volume. So the volume in the bin is decreasing while the volume in the pile is increasing. The rate of change of the volume in the bin and the rate of change of the volume in the cone must have the same magnitude but opposite signs. Okay, so I'm looking for a dV dt from the bin. when the height equals 12 centimeters. I'm expecting this one to come up negative, although I expect that the rate of change of the volume of the cone-shaped pile of sand is positive. The variables I were given don't refer to the bin. They refer to the conical pile. So instead of using that dVdt for the bin, I'm going to have to use this dVdt for the pile, which means this change in volume will be positive. And then I'll just change its sign to get the rate of change from the bin. So I need to relate the volume of this pile of sand to its height and radius. Well, for a pyramidal shape, you again take area of the base times the height, like you do for a regular solid, then you divide it by three. So the formula is one third area of the base pi r squared times the height. Now I need to look at this and figure out which of these is changing with respect to time. It changes. I cannot substitute a value for it until after I've done the derivative. The volume is definitely getting bigger down here, so I can't replace that. The radius is also growing as I add more sand to the pile, and it's getting taller, so the height's also changing. The problem is I'm only given dH dt and nothing about the radius. But I do know an equation that relates the radius and the height. The relationship is always radius equals 3h. So I'm going to represent the radius with 3h. I'm not substituting for the value. I'm simply rewriting the variable in another form. Now I have the relating equation, the volume of the conical pile is equal to nine halves pi h cubed. Pause the video, work it out, turn the video back on, and we'll discuss. We have our relating equation, volume equals nine pi divided by two times the variable h cubed. We take the derivative of the relating equation using the chain rule for the derivative of h cubed. This is going to give us 3h squared dh dt. When I multiply by the constant 9 pi over 2, I get 27 pi over 2. And then I want to evaluate this at the instant that h is 12 centimeters. So I replace h with that. And dH dt at that instant is 2 centimeters per second. Multiplying this out, I get the rate of change of the conical pile as 2,592 pi cubic centimeters per second. This is not the rate of change of the sand from the bin. The sand in the bin, the volume is decreasing, but it must be the same volume that is increasing in the pile. So we simply apply a negative, and that's our result. We've been at this for a while, so it might be time to take a break and do something else for a while, then come back so we can look at the last five examples. <laughs>